Okay, I'm going to go ahead and get started this morning with uh, a few introductory comments as the last few attendees come in and grab a seat. Can I have your attention, please? Thank you. My name is Rich Koenig. I'm the Associate Dean and Director for WSU Extension, and it's my pleasure and privilege to introduce the 2014 Direct Seed Oil Seed Cropping Systems Conference this morning. You are part of some 450 to 500 people who have registered for this event. I think that's near record attendance when you go back and look at the history of, of attendance at the Pacific Northwest Direct Seed Association Direct Seed Conference. So kudos to you. Um, I'm the, the buffer speaker. So my role is to make sure you're all in your seats before the keynote speakers um, come on here momentarily. Um, I have a few housekeeping items um, and introductions of distinguished guests. Um, we have with us Judy Olson the State Director of Farm Service Agency. Judy, thank you for joining us. Uh, we have with us as well, I believe he's here this morning, Mike Polson with Congresswoman Kathy McMorris Rogers' office. Mike, are you here? He may still be coming in. We also have with us David Replog from Senator Maria Cantwell's office. David, are you here? Yes. There, thank you. There may be other guests. Um, we'll introduce them and acknowledge them uh, throughout the day and tomorrow as well for the conference. Well, again, welcome. Welcome on behalf of Washington State University, the College of Agricultural, Human, and Natural Resource Sciences, the Pacific Northwest Direct Seed Association, um, and other entities, agencies represented here in the audience today. I wanted to take a moment to thank the conference organizers, Kay Meyer with the PNDSA. Kay is probably out at the registration table. Nope, she's waving from the back of the room. All right, thank you, Kay. And on the oilseed side of the organization, Karen Sowers, Karen, and Dennis Rowe. Okay both in the back of the room as well. And I wanted to give special recognition to uh, Bill Pan and Vicki McCracken. Um, as many of you know, most of you know, Bill Pan has been um, one of the lead entities, uh, faculty members leading the Washington State um, Oil Seed or Biofuel Cropping Systems Research and Extension Project for um, over four years now that project has been running. That's a, a project funded by the Washington State Department of Agriculture um, we have representatives from WSDA here um, today as well. Uh, Vicki, uh, Bill's spouse, is a faculty member in the School of Economic Sciences. She um, produces a lot of uh, useful tools related to um, economic forecast, um, economic calculators for um, oilseed production systems. Bill and Vicki hope to be here today, but again, as most of you know, Bill's been battling cancer. And at the last minute, he wasn't able to, to make the conference. He was really looking forward to it, but wasn't able to be here today. So we'll miss Bill. I would like to also thank the exhibitors and the sponsors for this conference. Um, this morning's coffee service was sponsored by Northwest Farm Credit Services. And the opening session, the keynote addresses, are sponsored by the major sponsors for the conference, Bear Crop Science, Cropland by Winfield, Odessa Trading Company, Ag Tech Services, and Pacific Coast Canola. So again, thank you to those major sponsors for the conference. And finally, I'd like to thank the, the speakers. We have speakers from all over the world, literally, here with us uh, for the next two and a half days. Uh, so we have international speakers, we have national speakers, regional and local speakers as well. Um, so we'll introduce them and acknowledge them as we go throughout the next two and a half days. I'd also like to thank the growers who are speakers at this conference. Um, some of the greatest value I've gotten from attending these conferences over the last several years um, is listening to the grower speakers relay their experiences. So thank you um, as well. Okay, our first speaker this morning is John Kierkegaard. And John is one of our international invited speakers. 
He's with the Commonwealth Scientific and Industrial Research Organization in Canberra, Australia, CSIRO. John has spent 25 years as a farming systems agronomist at CSIRO, where his research is conducted almost exclusively on farm. His research is focused on improving the productivity and sustainability of dryland mixed farming systems, including productivity of conservation cropping systems, direct seeded stubble retained systems, and integrating rotation crops, especially canola, into farming systems. He was awarded the 2008 Australian Grains Industry Seed of Light Award for research communication to growers and the 2013 CSIRO Medal for Impact from Science for leading a national product project to improve the water use efficiency of grain farming systems. So it's my pleasure to introduce John, and John, um, give him a warm welcome to the stage. Um, thanks very much to the organizers for in inviting me, the uh, Pacific Northwest Direct Seed Association and the w WSU Oil Seeds Group. Um, uh, I think it's, uh, it, it's really great to see those two groups come together and I commend the organisers for bringing those two groups together because there's no doubt in Australia, as I hope to show you, that uh, um, you've got to get the whole of the farming system right, the rotations and the tillage, to sort of get the most out of it. So I think it's really good that, uh, that you're here together and there's lots of growers to share their experiences. Um, just, uh, oh, that's okay. All right. So um, I guess the first question would be why did the organisers invite an Australian? And um, I guess the answer to that is that oil seed, an oilseed crop in Australia is the third most important crop after the two cereals. We're, we're mostly a wheat growing nation but canola is the main uh, non-cereal rotation crop. And we have one of the highest, if not the highest adoption of, of no-till farming systems around the world. And if you put those two things together, um, basically 95% of our canola crop in Australia is direct seeded. So in my talk this morning, I, I hope to do a few things. I, I think I need to give you a bit of a background to the Australian farming system because every system is different and just sort of put you in the picture of what our growers are, are dealing with in Australia. We have quite a lot in common with the Pacific Northwest and this is my fourth trip here. Um, uh, the researchers and the growers, I think, have shared a lot of information over the years. Uh, so, but I'll just put you in the picture about that. Then talk about the canola industry in Australia and how it got started and, and some of the development it's been through in the last 30 years. And then give you some uh, snippets of research that happened over the development phase of that crop, the important things that happened that have really moved it forward. And then finish with uh, a few a few pictures of uh, the current systems there for, for direct seed and canola that, that growers are using. So first of all, the, the Australian uh, environment and system, we weren't really blessed with, with uh, terribly fertile soils. It's an old continent. It's been weathered for a long time, and so we have some pretty, some pretty dreadful soils, in fact, around the place. Acid, sandy soils, compact soils, um, saline soils, sodic clays. There's usually some kind of soil constraint that growers are dealing with um, all the time. It, it's generally pretty dry. Uh, we get annual 12 to 20 inch rainfall. Um, and the, the growers are largely taking world prices for their products. So it's a, it's a, it's a low margin um, and the growers have to be very careful about their input costs and it's, and it's risky. So just to pick a, a typical um, area in Australia where people are growing grain, this is a historical weather records uh, and this is a sort of variability in annual rainfall uh, in any one place that growers are dealing with from year to year. Um, and you can see the, how it bumps around that average, the blue line is the average, so if you ask someone what their average rainfall is they can tell you but you very rarely get the average rainfall. So they're dealing with uh, quite, a, quite a lot of uncertainty um, which influences the way they, they farm. And you can see there in the last 10 years, we really have taken a bit of a step down in, in annual rainfall. Very, very late sowing opportunities, very dry springs, and this has also influenced the way that the farming system has, has moved. So just to, to put you in the picture of the cropping year in Australia, so um, we're in the southern hemisphere, of course, and so things are a bit back to front, but it, it doesn't stop there. We, we grow spring crops in our winter. Um, so uh, we're, 
we're looking to sow crops in our autumn, so that's somewhere around April, May for us. Um, historically, we've generally waited for a sowing rain, and, we, and you really don't know whether that, when that's going to come. Uh, so it could be anywhere from April to June that you'd be sowing the crop. Uh, the crop's developing then through our winter. We, we don't go under snow. We, we have a cold winter, but, but it never goes under snow. Animals are not housed. They're, they're outdoors all the time. And so the, the winter is cold but mild. The crop continues to grow. And our major issues are frost at flowering. We want to have the crop flowering after the last frost, but maturing before things get too hot in summer. We only grow one crop a year, uh, and over the summer fallow, uh, we usually just manage weeds and some people run sheep on the stubble, but that's it, one crop per year grown through, through autumn to spring. And that just shows the development phases of, of, uh, of canola in our system. So just to, to give you an idea of how the farming system there evolved quickly, so you have some background, um, Basically up until the 1980s, I won't go into much before that, but up until the 90, 1980s the, the farming system revolved around a pasture lay of clover or medic, a legume grass pasture, which was generally grown for three or four years to build up fertility. Then we would crop that out to, to cereals for two, maybe three years, not, not longer. Uh, sheep were run on the, on the pasture uh, for wool and the cereal crops uh, were sold, and that was a, quite a profitable uh, enterprise through those years. Uh, but prior to the advent of herbicides, of course, it was all with tillage. Residues were generally burnt. Uh, people believed you need a very worked seedbed to get crops up. Uh, and so at the bottom there you see the typical uh, processes that people would go through to, to establish a crop. Um, farmers were awarded prizes on the, on the, on the uh, sort of how, how good their mulch was, their dust mulch from the cultivation. But you can see that uh, the sort of thing that happened uh, in our soils, they, they very quickly uh, lose organic matter, the structure falls apart and they, they crust and you, you see the sort of symptoms I show you there. But because the pasture was coming back in quite regularly, um, the pasture would generally regenerate that structure and because the cropping phase wasn't too long, uh, I think this system persisted for, for quite a long time. But during the 1990s, uh, wool prices started to drop and what happened then was uh, growers started extending the cropping phase, shortening the pasture phase. Um, as well as that, farms had to get bigger to stay, to stay economically viable. So you had this intensification of cropping and a reduction in sheep numbers and pasture area and uh, you, we got a sort of a rotation that you see there, shorter pasture phase and then a series of crops which also diversified. Um, to grow that many cereals in a row, people need to bring in uh, break crops, and they were either legumes like lupins, or in my case, canola. And also during this period was when no-till, stubble retention, conservation agriculture generally uh, was developed and, and uh, began to be adopted um, during this period. And you see at the bottom now, uh, some, some of the sorts of systems that, that uh, people are in, inter-row sowing of standing residue uh, and with, with diversity in the rotation. During the 2000s we had uh, what we call now the millennium drought which was about 10 years of below average rainfall and I guess this has been a new phase in our, in our cropping system and during that period the the oilseed and legume crops do become quite risky in our environment. They don't do as well as the cereals in really dry environments, and particularly with late sowing opportunities. So they tended to drop out of the system. And growers started growing, you know, fence to fence wheat, uh, inter row sowing wheat back onto wheat. And in dry seasons, you can get away with that for a while. But it wasn't diseases that started to bring that system unstuck, it was the emergence of herbicide tolerant weeds. Because we had removed the sheep and the pasture phase, we were continually cropping cereals with no-till systems, totally relying on herbicides, we quickly, quickly developed resistance, particularly in annual ryegrass. Um, and we now have annual ryegrass populations that are resistant to all of the herbicides we have, including Roundup, and you can see there the number of Roundup resistant ryegrass populations that, are, that have uh, developed in Australia. And this now pretty much dominates uh, what growers can do in their, in their farming system. This is now really driving what, what we do and how we manage things. You can see that wheat crop at the bottom. Um, 
The one on your right is just infested with ryegrass that, that uh, did not respond to any of the herbicide treatments that were thrown at it. So, um, so here's a typical farm in 2014 that, that you, you might see. Uh, still mixed farming is the, underpins it, so farmers still have sheep um, and, uh, and crops together and integrated onto the same farm. But generally now there's more area of crop, smaller areas of pasture, but, but a diversity of crops. We've swung back to reasonably average and above average rainfall in the last couple of years, so we're sort of back to this, this type of system. What I'd um, like to do is uh, take you through, I guess, some of the research and some of the, some of the key things that were going on in each of those phases I mentioned, particularly with the development of canola and how canola has assisted in the, in the development of our current system. This is just a, a picture of wheat yield in Australia since we started growing wheat um, in the 1800s. Uh, you can see what happened when we first arrived and, and didn't understand soil fertility and in fact fertilisers were not even understood back then. Uh, we just saw a lot of rapid decline in wheat yields. We were just using the natural fertility of the soil. But we turned that around in the early part of the 1900s with new wheat varieties that were adapted to our season length with the uh, understanding of fertilisers and fallowing. Um, you can see the year-to-year -year yield jumping around and variable, but I've drawn on there the, the red line is sort of decadal averages joined up and what you see are just phases where new farming systems came in. The combination of new varieties and better management came in and gave us a real step change in, in overall productivity. And that step change you see um, around the, uh, starting in around uh, 1980, um, conservation agriculture, the advent of herbicides and no-till, the introduction of break crops and the response then to the nitrogen that we were applying in the system um, you can really see what that did over a, over a 10 year period. And then as I mentioned we hit the millennium drought from which, from which we've just um, emerged and uh, what growers will tell you is that they had not adopted the sort of systems they're using now in Australia then the yields that you see there in the millennium drought you know, they just wouldn't have been getting crops at all. Um, so they were actually able to stay viable and, and survive that period and uh, now they're back to sort of more, more normal yields. I'm sorry I've changed all of my uh, yields here from tonnes to hectare to pounds per acre so sorry there's some funny numbers on those, uh, on those axes but I hope, uh, I hope that makes, makes sense and I, and, I, and I understand wheat's in bushels per acre but anyway everything's in pounds per acre so please uh, uh, do the sums in your head if you can. So I mentioned that that period from 1980 saw, really saw the, the adoption of, of no-till or direct seed um, farming systems and this is the, the rate of adoption in Australia. Uh, and so you can see people first started tinkering with it in the 1970s when some of the first herbicides for weed control were available but there was a very long lead time uh, as people tried the, the new systems and um, uh, and then you see that when the systems started to come together in the 1980s and into the 1990s it really took off. In areas where soil erosion was particularly bad, the, the, the wind erosion in, the, in Western Australia on the sands and the water erosion on clays in Queensland, those areas really got in early and are, and are up to nearly 100% adoption. Um, other areas which have a lot of sheep, mixed farming systems in wetter areas uh, on different soil types, on acid soil types where, where lime incorporation and other things are needed, uh, it's also grown but it hasn't quite hit the same levels of adoption. So I just briefly want to talk about some of the factors that, that uh, initiated that, I've called it a revolution, um, it was an evolution, but the, the, there was a convergence of factors in the 1970s that really uh, laid the foundation for change and that was a realisation by government after several national audits of the terrible state that our soils were in from the farming system that we were, uh, were using. Um, as I showed you before, a lot of ploughing and burning, we had, we had erosion, we had compaction, uh, we had salinity, we had a lot of issues uh, related to that and, and it finally got onto the political uh, agenda and government started giving some incentives to do something about it. That was one issue. The second issue was purely economic. What I've showed you there is what a grower was receiving 
in 1972 and in, 18, and in 1982 what, what they were receiving for a tonne of grain, around 100 bucks. And it didn't change for 10 years what they got paid. What they could buy with that 100 bucks uh, in 1972 was 600 gallons of fuel. Ten years later, it would only buy uh, 84 gallons of fuel. So if that wasn't an incentive to, to look for ways in their farming system to reduce fuel use alone, uh, um, then they, they really weren't being, paying a lot of attention. Uh, so there were some just straight economic drivers. Um, but finally, there was some technology and some key enabling technology, and, and uh, growers were, were, were very quick and uh, to, to try these things, uh, and there was a lot of on-farm and, and grower-led innovation behind a lot of these changes. I just want to touch on three of them um, and not spend a lot of time. The first one, of course, was the advent of, of herbicides so that farmers no longer had to till to control weeds. And you see there the development of how they were rolled out um, through the 70s and into the 80s. Uh, first of all, the knockdown spray seed, paraquat, diquat, then some selective grass herbicides that could be used in crop um, to control grass weeds and obviously Roundup uh, which, which now has become the, the platform for a lot of the fallow management uh, of no-till systems. There was also obviously a lot of machinery development that was required and that's, a lot of that happened on farms and with farmers. Um, and there was sort of an evolution of, of, of the way in which growers went about it. First, reducing the number of cultivations, but still using disturbance, through to direct seeding where there was only one pass to sow the crop, but with a lot of different types and levels of disturbance. So full cutout, um, right down to now zero till with very minimum disturbance and, and discs. Uh, also machinery to deal with residue, and that starts with the harvest, machinery around the harvester to, to keep the residue in a state that's going to allow you to sow through it the following year, as well as um, residue uh, clearing and, and other um, innovations on the seeding machine. Uh, and as I said, a lot, a lot of uh, direct grower innovation and, and invention and development in that, in that uh, area. And finally, and, and uh, this is where, the, where canola came into it, was the availability of broadleaf rotation crops. Uh, trying to do this no-till in continuous cereal just really, just really didn't work, both for weed and disease reasons. And so until we had in the system a profitable, reliable um, break crop, and that was initially lupins in Western Australia in the 1980s and, and then sometime later canola, um, then we really didn't have the platform on which to build uh, the no-till system. So that was what I considered to be the third main plank of, of development. And that leads me into, into um, a, a bigger discussion about canola and its role. So really these, these broadleaf break crops weren't available to Australian farmers, well adapted to our system until that time. Uh, and during the 1990s, uh, I spent a lot of time looking at the impact of those rotation crops and comparing them uh, in our systems. And uh, to cut a long story short, they're really necessary for, for weed, for managing diseases, for managing weeds. If you go with legumes, you get some nitrogen benefit. Uh, and also the residues were far more easier for direct seeding operations with a following wheat crop than trying to get through a lot of cereal residue at that time. So there were a lot of things, that, a lot of advantages that made these really important to the system. Um, and here's a brief history of, uh, of the development of canola in Australia, because that's relatively recent and it almost tracks with the no seeding, uh, with the no till development. Um, we started playing with, with rapeseed as it was then back in the 1970s, uh, but our crop was completely decimated in 1976 by the disease blackleg. Um, I guess you guys have blackleg here as well, some places it's called FOMA, but that actually wiped the crop out and it took a long time for us to get resistant varieties back into Australia that, that were resistant to, to blackleg. Uh, if we took Canadian varieties directly to Australia, they, they're knocked over by our isolates. It's an extremely virulent disease in Australia and, and, it, and it remains constantly, breeders have to keep on top of resistance for this disease. Um, but if you see there from 1990, when we really got the first uh, um, adapted canola that was blackleg resistant, it only took 10 years to take us from nothing to 2 million hectares. Uh, and uh, there's a lot of, there was a lot of um, 
uh, factors, I guess, in that. But the one thing was it sort of sold itself. Once growers got it into the field, into these, far into these farms which had been grassy pasture, wheat and barley, when you get a broadleaf rotation in and you see what it does to your wheat crop, it really sold itself. Um, so all we had to do was, was I guess, uh, assist the farmers in, in, in knowing how to grow the canola well and th they were keen. Um, we then went into a bit of a phase where canola got too popular and, and started getting put into the rotation very intensively uh, and ran into some problems of its own. Uh, and we've, and more, most recently we've sort of now have available to us some of the GM hybrids which until 2009 were, were not allowed to be grown in Australia and that's now heralding a new phase of development of the crop. So this just shows you that, uh, that development. If you look at the green line, that's the area. You can see there was pretty much nothing up until, up until 1990. Uh, and then it grew rapidly up to, two, up to sorry, five million acres. Um, uh, and then we, we uh, as I said, we sort of overdid it a bit. We pushed it into areas where it wasn't terribly well adapted. Um, and uh, probably had it a little bit too intensively in some systems. We, you can then see the period of the millennium drought where it dropped right out of our system and it's recovered now and we're up to the highest areas uh, in, since we started these last couple of years. One thing I should point out that's interesting is that Australia um, for a long time, up until recently, grew 80% triazine tolerant canola. So this is canola that's resistant to triazine herbicides. Now I think they're banned in the US but we put four litres of, of simazine per hectare onto our canola crops and that, uh, it, it was always intriguing that people were worried about uh, GM canola coming in but I don't think a lot of them knew we, uh, the sort of herbicides that we were using on our existing non-GM but TT, TT uh, tolerant canola. And that has to do with the weed spectrum we have in Australia, wild radish, uh, shepherd's purse, a lot of weeds um, that were well controlled with triazine herbicides and we still have 50% triazine tolerant herbicides. Now that gene for triazine tolerance has a 25% yield uh, reduction effect on the photosynthesis of the crop. So growers are still using TT varieties even knowing that they have this, this issue because it's that valuable as a rotation crop in their system. Um, more recently with Roundup Ready hybrids, Clearfield hybrids, growers have other options with canola. So it's, the hybrids are really coming in now. Um, some of the other important things in the development you see on that blue line against the yield, there was a, there was a, a program called Canola Check. And I think it was really uh, valuable in, in getting that area of canola up. That was a simple agronomic check for growers, a checklist of things on one page where they could go out at different stages in the crop cycle and tick off the fact that, you know, yes, I've got 40 plants per square metre, yes, I've done this, I've done that. And it was very simple, very, uh, but very helpful in getting those guys into a new crop. Remember, they were all wheat farmers and canola was a very different sort of a crop with different pests and um, a lot of people thought a difficult crop to grow, but with that, with that extension program called Canola Check, it really, it really helped that area uh, increase. So currently, as I said this year, I think we've got the biggest area of canola we've ever had. It, it remains the third most valuable grain crop um, in Australia. Um, after wheat and barley, you can see that we export 75% of our crop, um, so that's the main. It's mainly an export crop. We do have some some local crushing uh, capacity, and of course the meal. It's very important. The meal side of things is very important uh, in the profitability of the whole enterprise, and it's used in uh, high protein animal rations. I gave a talk in uh, eastern Canada a couple of years ago where they were opening a crushing plant in, in eastern. Canada where they traditionally didn't grow a lot of canola and, and uh, the, the current wisdom there was, you know, it, it was just too tough, you know, there was all these difficulties with canola and so they, they, they thought, well, if people can do it in Australia, you know, must be, we must be able to do it. So the, they, they got me over to talk to them and, and these were some of the things that you get thrown at you when you're trying to convince people to grow canola. These are all of the, you know, there's a bit of truth in all of them. Um, but the question is, at the end of the day, is, is, is canola profitable uh, and will it be profitable in your system? Um, and so I'd like to show you now a little bit of the research that, that uh, we, um, we went through along the way, along that development phase, uh, that helped us to sort of overcome some of these issues. So a photo speaks a thousand words and this is why Australian farmers got into canola. Uh, they saw what it did to their wheat crops. They didn't like growing canola initially. It was, it was more difficult, it was different, 
it was a small seed. Um, they had they had difficulties, but when, they are wheat farmers, and when they saw their wheat crops, uh, they saw wheat crops like they've never seen before. And you can see this wheat crop here, um, full of tapeall and, and fusarium and other diseases. Uh, they'd never seen such healthy-looking wheat crops. And I did a lot of experiments on a lot of farms, and essentially. Uh, that blue, the blue bars there show you the extra wheat yield we got after canola compared to after wheat. You see a few little yellow ones there where we got less yield slightly in some dry seasons, but by and large it was a consistently increased yield uh, when we grew wheat after canola compared to wheat after wheat. And when I summarised that 10 years of, of data, um, Basically, there was a 20% increase in the, in the yield of the following wheat on average. And if you looked at the economics, uh, there was a 27% increase in the two-year gross margin, so canola wheat versus wheat wheat. And roughly only a third of that extra money was due to the canola crop itself. 70% of it was coming from the better wheat crop in the second year. So you really had to take a two-year view to, to fully um, account for the benefits from canola. So roughly for us it worked out that if the canola price was 60% higher than the wheat price, you were better off uh, going with a canola wheat rotation. So there were some simple rules of thumb at that time that were, were operating. And there were a lot of other system benefits. We saw rotation benefits of canola going through into a second and sometimes third year cereal after canola. Um, there were a lot of weed management benefits and as I said, guys who were very keen to get into a uh, conservation ag and no-till, they were really trying it, but they were having difficulties until they got some of these uh, broadleaf rotation crops, which, which overcome some of the problems they were having. More recently, we revisited uh, that data and added more data, and what we found was rather than a 20% yield increase, which is kind of a proportional increase, that a 20% increase means that when your wheat yield is high, the increase in wheat yield is high. What we actually found was that on average it's a constant benefit. So it doesn't matter whether your wheat, uh, what your wheat is yielding, you get a very constant, in our case, 720 pound per acre benefit to the wheat crop after canola. And what that meant was we were undervaluing the benefit of these rotation crops to wheat in dry seasons. We'd always sort of thought that in dry seasons we're not going to see much of a rotation benefit. Actually when we put the data together it's quite variable as you can see. Those points jump around a lot, but if you fit a line, there's an average benefit. Uh, so all the points are above the line, and the average is about an extra 720 pounds per acre. Um, and that made quite a difference to, to the way we looked at um, how and where we might get benefits from canola. And in the area where I lived, um, I, I wanted to show you that this is those decadal wheat yields since we started growing wheat again. And the bottom line shows the national trend. The green line above, which is pointing out the area of New South Wales where I work, we just happened to be in an area where the benefits from canola were real, you could really capitalise on them. We had, we had uh, acid soils um, and people were liming to grow canola and that liming benefit went right through the system into pastures and to wheat. We had good rainfall and we could capitalise on, on a healthy root system and a healthy crop. So we saw enormous benefits in the particular area where I was growing uh, to having canola in the rotation to following wheat crops. And as I said, it was a whole system on these acid soils. You needed lime to grow canola. So you can see here some lines just showing, don't worry about the units, but what I'm just showing you, as canola area went up, so too did lime area applied, and so too did nitrogen fertiliser application. And that's because Farmers were getting no response to nitrogen fertiliser in wheat uh, in the 1980s. Once we got canola in the system, the crops started responding to the nitrogen fertiliser inputs. So a healthy root system starts to make better use of the inputs you're already adding to your crop. And so nitrogen fertiliser use, it wasn't all being applied to the canola, it was being applied to the wheat after the canola because it was responding. Prior to that, had not responded to the nitrogen. So um, that's a little bit about why growers got into canola. And then, as I said, it took off and we had five, up to 5, 000, 5 million acres by 2000 of canola. And then there was a period of, of yield decline. So we actually started to see canola yields plateauing and, and declining. And we did quite a lot of work to try and understand you know, what, was, what was going on there. 
And that led us into asking some questions about, well, how do you know what your canola should be yielding? And this, is, uh, this benchmarking idea is something that's been very widely used in Australia and very powerful. And it's about challenging growers to, to think about and, and ask themselves, you know, what should I really have got this year? You know, what should my crop have yielded? And quite often Australian farmers tended to blame the rainfall. Water is the thing that drives yield, and so they would say, oh, we just didn't get the rain. Uh, but there were some simple rules of thumb developed in Australia, initially in wheat, but we developed them for canola, telling you, based on your rainfall, how much yield should you have gotten if your crop had, uh, had been grown to its potential. And that becomes very powerful because you can say, you can look at your yield and say, well, you know, this is telling me I should have got um, uh, this yield and I'm, I'm well below that. Uh, and you can start asking questions why that is. So if you're not benchmarking yourself, um, it's hard to know um, how you're travelling. So there are simple rules of thumb. There are some of these water uh, limited yield based things that are accessible to growers. And then you can get up to sort of fairly complicated things, models that are available for predicting yield. So a lot of farmers in our area had a rule of thumb that I should expect half of my wheat yield. Um, and you might have a similar kind of rule of thumb here. And what we showed was that's sort of true um, until you get into, into dry seasons when, depending on when the stress actually hits a wheat or a canola crop, it can do very different things to yield. So it, it's a reasonable rule of thumb up to a certain, uh, or up at a certain yield level below which it becomes very unreliable. Sometimes wheat will yield more than canola, sometimes less, just depends when the stress happens. So that's not a bad rule of thumb, it's simple, but um, you can see it's a little bit uh, uh, dodgy. And here's the water limited yield concept, which just essentially says, after I allow for a little bit of evaporation, in this case about four inches is gonna evaporate no matter what I do, after that, I should expect a certain amount of canola yield for every inch of rain I get. Uh, and I've converted our Australian rule of thumb uh, into one for you guys. And when I put all of my yield data together on crops that I knew to have no major constraints to growth and related it to how much water they received, um, on average it said I should expect 240 pounds per acre per inch of growing season rainfall that that crop saw after allowing for four inches that you're going to lose no matter what you do. And it varies, of course, because the rain falls at different times. And so we could put a boundary around that to say, well, in the, in the years where the rain falls in the best possible way, it's going to be up around 3.30. Um, and in the years where uh, things are a bit tight or stress at critical times, it might drop. But So if you plot your own crops, uh, and they fell under that line. In other words, you got 16 inches of rain, but you only got 1,000 pounds per acre. You could ask questions, well, what, 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 what went wrong? You know, I really should have been up here. And this was an extremely powerful tool and simple tool that Australian farmers are still using today, both in wheat and canola, to challenge themselves. You can get groups of growers to anonymously put all their own data together and see that, you know, well, this person in the same place in the same year was up here and I was there, and they can start just talking about what they were doing differently. So that's been very powerful. And obviously there are more complicated computer models that can take into account every daily rainfall, temperatures, soil type, nitrogen availability, management. Uh, they're in the hands of researchers mostly, although in Australia we do have now a web-based canola model um, called Yield Profit, which growers can subscribe to. They can put in their information and it will tell them what their yield prediction is through the season, should I apply nitrogen, um, should I not? What's the economics of it? Um, so it has advanced to that stage, but you need a lot of data uh, and good soil information for that to be reliable, but it is available. And we did use that uh, at this time to look at the difference between what the model was telling us we should have got um, and what we were achieving. And you can see that the yield uh, potential predicted by the model was, was those uh, purple circles uh, and what we were actually achieving uh, is the yellow triangles. And um, you can see that in the dry seasons, they pretty much coincided. So in the dry seasons, the canola was yielding pretty much what, what the model was saying it should. And it was in the wet seasons when the potential was way up and we just weren't hitting the potential. So we turned our attention to what was going on in, uh, in, in those wet seasons because we could see that was where we were missing out on, on yield. And the first thing we looked at, so we looked at a few things. Um, 
The first thing we knew was that growers were having a lot of trouble getting canola to establish in wheat residue. So when they tried direct drilling into cereal residue, they always saw this issue here, that the stubble retained treatment would be slower, it wouldn't respond to nitrogen, it would sort of get what they call the winter blues, um, compared to where they were removing the stubble in some way. Um, and we did, some, we did some measurements and people were getting about a 25% yield loss. And everybody was saying, oh, it's allelopathy. There's, there's toxic chemicals coming out of the wheat straw and it's, it's affecting the canola. So we set about to try and understand what was going on here. And um, I became famous for a while in, in Australia for what, what's called the plastic straw experiment. Um, and that's a sort of bird's eye view of the trial where I figured if there was chemicals coming out of wheat straw that were causing a problem, we should be able to use plastic drinking straws as a, as a comparison. And if the canola grew really well after the, uh, under the plastic drinking straws compared to the wheat stubble, um, yeah, we knew we had some sort of chemical thing. Otherwise, if plastic drinking straws do the same thing to canola as wheat straw, it's probably a physical thing. So there's the experiment, plastic drinking straws. There were a range of different amounts and degree of weathering of the stubble and some burn plots as well. And essentially the results were very simple. Anything that had uh, anything spread over the top of the canola uh, reduced the growth and anything where the canola was, had nothing over the top of it grew better. So that tells me it's not a chemical thing, it's nothing because plastic drinking straws are having the same effect as wheat. So we did some further experiments to try and find out what was going on and I think this picture kind of tells the story. Um, I didn't need to have wheat straw to cause the problem. All I had to do was make canola grow in shade. So here I just put some little plastic pipe over the canola and made it grow up out of that, oops, out of that pipe. And what I saw was a little canola seedling very similar to the ones that were coming up above wheat stubble. Um, and then for their trouble, once they opened above the wheat stubble, they would cop a colder morning temperature. A, a frost above the straw was colder every morning. So no wonder the poor crop was not responding and not growing in winter. It was stuck with tiny leaves and it really just couldn't get away. And as often happens, it was the grower who came to see me after one of our talks and said, well, I don't have any trouble growing canola in wheat stubble. And, and we went out to his farm and had a look at what he was doing. And at that time, growers were advised to, to drag harrows behind their machines to spread the straw out. They didn't want any clumps of straw which would hook up their machinery. So they were trying to spread it as, as, as well as they could. Uh, and of course, what that meant was that all the canola was coming up through wheat straw and looked like those little guys at the bottom there. Um, what he did was take the harrows off. He had narrow points and press wheels that he, uh, he, he widened the rows so that when he went through seeding, it would push the stubble up onto the inter row and he just had this small area right around the canola row where there wasn't any residue sitting on top of the, of the crop. And a little bit would fall back in and you'd see a, a little bit of an effect. But at the end of the season, that had exactly the same yield as the, as the burn. So he was very happy to be able to achieve um, the same yields without having to go out and burn his residue. The other issue uh, in these wet areas was disease. So the main two diseases we have are blackleg and sclerotinia. Um, and they're both worse in wet seasons. And so we, we really didn't know how much they were costing us. So we put in a series of experiments where we totally controlled those diseases with fungicides, you know, way over the top, not economic, but we just wanted to control them and see what, what they were costing us. And sure enough, um, over a period of years, we could see that um, sclerotinia, which remains a bit of a, a difficult one for us, extremely variable. You, it, sometimes it's there, sometimes it's not. Sometimes it's there and you control for it and you don't get a response. It, it, it's a tough one. Um, but we, in some seasons, were losing significant amount of yield to sclerotinia. Um, whereas blackleg was there every year, and even on our highly resistant varieties, we were getting responses to fungicide for treating blackleg. So this focused everybody in on, on getting their disease control in canola right. Uh, and we showed with our modelling that if we went in and controlled the diseases, mostly we got, we got uh, crops yielding to their potential. So um, we did a wider survey of fields. That, that area was in a high rainfall zone and, and people further west and drier areas were sort of saying, oh, we don't, think we, uh, we don't think we're really suffering from disease, but we think we've got some other problems. Um, and so this survey was conducted over three years that turned out to be quite dry, very low disease levels, and, and about 75% of the crops actually did yield to their potential. So, so, so I think disease, we were right on the right track with disease, but there were still some things going on with canola. 
Um, we couldn't find any evidence that we had any sort of nutritional issue, uh, micronutrients or nitrogen, but the underperforming crops um, had a couple of things in common. They, they tended to be in seasons where there was a lot of heat um, late in the season on crops that had developed quite a lot of biomass. Um, and that's still something I think that, that uh, hits canola quite hard, heat and water stress at the same time. Uh, but that was something we could sort of explain. Um, and then there was this range of subsoil constraints that people were suggesting might be having an issue. And one thing we saw in a lot of canola paddocks, 60% of fields in some areas, we went in and pulled up 50 plants out of every field randomly and rated the taproot. And 60% of fields had a rating on that scale at the bottom above three. So the taproot had a serious distortion. We call it right angle root disease. Um, and that suggests there's some kind of physical or chemical uh, constraint there affecting the crop. So we launched into a, a series of experiments. This was a grower uh, built machine for us. He built a, he sort of converted an air seeder and a ripper so that we could blow gypsum and lime deep down into the profile because we, we had acid compact layers just below the level of um, soil disturbance because growers sort of put lime on the top and it sort of limes the, the, the top few uh, inches of soil. The soil in the subsoil is quite alkaline, but what was happening, we were getting this acid layer just below where the lime was penetrating to, uh, and it was quite hard and quite acid, and we figured this must be affecting the canola. Um, so we did a lot of experiments, ripping in lime and gypsum, and we really got no yield responses. Um, even with those right angle roots on the canola, we, di we didn't get yield responses. And what was clear to us was that the canola roots were finding their way down. They were using old cracks and channels and wormholes and all sorts of things, and they looked terrible. But in a lot of cases, um, in spite of the fact that we'd rip and the roots would look better and the crop might grow a little bit better earlier on, we didn't get a lot of uh, economic yield responses to that kind of expensive soil treatment. Um, and that surprised us a little. And it, but it also showed us that canola was quite tolerant of acidity, um, and that surprised us because we had been showing that you really had to lime canola in the surface. And I, and I think um, if canola can get through a, 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 you know, an acid top, if you can get it established and, and, and get it through, it can push its root through layers of, of, of acid soil, um, but it really can't establish in acid soil. We also showed that it's probably the uh, manganese in acid soil that really troubles canola. If you have aluminium or aluminum, in your acid soil. Canola is actually reasonably tolerant of that, but if it's manganese, uh, it really suffers badly. So it really depended on what sort of acid soil you had. But that helped us to sort of direct the growers to be careful about spending money on this. Where we did find ripping help was in wet areas where gypsum and ripping would stop you getting waterlogged in a wet winter. We really got big responses to that, but not so much the acidity and the, and the, and the compaction. Um, we have a lot of variable soils in Australia and we put a few trials onto some of these using uh, EM maps of the paddock and then going and sampling. Uh, this was caused by salt in the subsoil, which we have on quite a lot of soils. And we could um, sort of show here that canola was sensitive to that salt in the subsoil. It restricted the rooting depth of the canola, but that really only showed up as a yield effect if you had uh, a dry spring. If, if, the, if the season remained wet and the canola could access water in the surface, you didn't see a yield effect. Uh, if the thing, if the season turned dry, you would. So it was, it was a little bit variable, but salinity was certainly something that um, growers could, could map and then maybe if they had an issue in a field, perhaps uh, not, um, not so canola there or, or be aware of it anyway and manage the inputs to the yield that was expected in those conditions. So we hit the millennium drought, I told you, in the sort of two, around 2002. And then really success with canola became uh, a focus on reducing the risk. Um, the crop costs more to set up than wheat, so you're putting some risk out there. And, if, and, and with the seasons we were getting late sowing, reduces your potential 5% a week later you sow. So every week later you sow, you lose 5% yield potential in the canola. Um, so we had to look for ways to try and make canola less risky. Uh, and there's four I've listed there, and I won't have time today to sort of go through all of them. Um, I just want to talk about the grazing work I did. But to mention briefly that we came up with a canola suitability index 
in which you divide the day of the year, um, so, you know, 126 day if it's May or whatever, by the amount of um, subsoil moisture in millimetres that you have. And you come up with an index uh, and it creates a floor. You, you, you can pick a certain yield um, that you must reach to break even. And there's a, there's a suitability index that goes with that. And if your suitability index drops below that level, then we say don't sow canola. So if you're sufficiently late with sufficiently little soil moisture, we say don't grow canola. So by stopping people from growing canola when it's not likely to be profitable, uh, you know, you avoid this kind of uh, reputation it has for, for being risky. Um, the modelling, uh, the yield profit model I mentioned, which is available to farmers on the web, is another way that helps them to manage risk in canola. The biggest risk being how much nitrogen to apply uh, mid-season. And um, finally, uh, most recently, with people who have got themselves into a terrible state with herbicide resistant weeds, legume, what we call legume brown manure crops. So these are grain legumes that are grown till flowering and then sprayed. So rather than a green manure, we call it a brown manure. You can get a good kill on weeds, um, you can store some, some nitrogen and you can start storing soil water from, from September. Uh, and if you put canola in after a crop like that, uh, given you've got a bad weed problem, uh, that's now becoming economic on a lot of farms and by reducing risk and input costs. But the grazing, uh, this was an idea that um, we, we'd already been grazing cereals for a long time in Australia, um, but no one had tried it with canola. And obviously if you can make some money in winter by grazing your sheep on canola, you've taken some of the risk out of the crop. Um, so we started this in 2004 and we did a lot of experiments um, looking at you know, varieties and, and um, what varieties to use, um, how to manage the grazing, and came up with some rules of thumb that, that work. Um, we, we can generally sow the canola, canola earlier than you normally would which creates a lot of biomass in the autumn. You can then graze that through the winter. And the key thing is to take the animals off before the crop starts to elongate. Um, and that won't cause much of a delay in flowering and the crop will sort of just fall back into the normal window and we generally get the same yield as ungrazed crops after making a few hundred dollars off it uh, in the winter. So this was something that really helped with the risk. So as I said, the, the key here is knowing when to stop grazing. It didn't sort of really matter how hard we grazed it. Interestingly enough, if we were, if we were sort of in, the win in winter and there was plenty of time for the crop to recover um, and we got the animals off early enough to allow that recovery, I was just amazed and didn't believe it year after year. I brought consultants in so they could see it because um, I thought I was going crazy, but uh, it just, it, the yield was unaffected pr provided we got the animals off um, before the bud started to elongate. And so um, just to show you on, the, on your left there, there's a crop that, that was grazed, and I mean, you know, grazed into the ground. I wouldn't recommend this. We were, we were hammering it very hard to push, to push it and see what effect it had on blackleg. But um, on July the 28th, the two crops looked like that. And when I harvested in November, they both yielded the same. So it just has an amazing capacity to recover from defoliation, at least in our environment. So it's something. And uh, you can see there, there's a range of experiments, winter and spring canolas. The winter ones you can put in a lot earlier and get a lot of grazing. And there's the sheep grazing in, in sheep days per acre. In other words, you know, 440 means you can either put 440 sheep on an acre for one day or, or 20 sheep on there for, for 20 days. Um, that's the sort of um, grazing we get off it. And as you can see, yield was, was really unaffected. So this grazing has a lot of system benefits. Um, if you avoid a yield penalty, it's just all profit, um, and, uh, which is what we aim for. But if you can make a lot of money out of fat lambs in winter, then you can obviously, tr you, you can obviously take a, a, some yield loss because you may well be making a lot of money from, from getting fat lambs on the market uh, early. Um, having the grazed, while you're grazing your crops, your pastures are getting a spell. And that means when the animals go back onto the pasture in spring, you've got a lot more pasture there for, for, for ewes that are lambing or, or lactating. Um, because you sow the grazing canola earlier, it starts to widen up your sowing windows. You can sow something earlier than you normally would because you know you're going to graze it and get the development right. Um, and you can graze it, you can make hay. If the, if the season turns bad, you can make silage. There's a lot of flexibility. And there's a grower who, um, 
10 years ago only grew wool and um, he's really now diversified his system um, and included grazing crops including, including canola. Um, so I thought I'd just finish off, uh, Chair, with uh, a few pictures um, of uh, the way we do it now. Um, and uh, all of these options are, are valid options depending on the circumstance that you find yourself in. Um, burning in Australia now is pretty limited uh, and it's always done late, so almost, you know, if they burn it'll be late when it's cool and they'll basically be seeding into the smouldering ashes. They, they really want the soil protected for as long as possible. But for those guys with issues, either their machinery is not quite yet set up to handle heavy stubbles, uh, or they may have a weed issue or a mouse issue or something. Um, late burning is still something people use. So here's a, here's a system now that, uh, but, but almost no cultivation. Um, it would, as I said, almost all be direct seeded and how much residue you can handle depends on your setup and what, you, what you've been able to afford. But people are sort of, you know, as best they can economically moving in this, in this direction. Prior to some of the more recent herbicides, we, we mostly used trifluralin and that had to be incorporated in the soil and so hence the, in the early days there was a lot of cultivation to get canola in. It's when people usually applied their lime so they got, a, they got another kind of use for the soil disturbance but um, now it's really, the amount of cultivation is really limited. So that's a, a late cool burn, it's being direct seeded with narrow tines and press wheels and this would be the majority of people in Australia would be using narrow tines um, rather than discs. So the debate rages, the comparisons go on, disc versus tine. Um, it really depends uh, on your soil and the conditions and actually a lot of guys will keep both. Um, they may buy, buy a new disc machine but they'll always have a, a tine machine in the shed because there are always circumstances and soils where it, it, it helps. Um, and then, of course, if you, if you have equipment that can handle it, uh, then, it, then people will sow directly into stubble. So here's a machine now with, with uh, the stubble retained, direct seeding with narrow tines and press wheels. And um, again, this would be, you know, the vast majority of people with that much residue would be, would be managing fine with a system like that. Then if you, you know, if you have a little bit more residue um, or you have a disc system, um, basically here's a disc system. You can see ahead of the discs there's a little stubble, what we call a stubble star or a clearance wheel. It's just rolling along and flicking um, a little bit of the stubble out of the way of the, of the discs that are coming through. Um, so uh, that's an example of a, of a, of a disc seeder sowing canola there into, into retained wheat residue. Um, and then I guess uh, this would sort of be where the most advanced sort of guys are, are at. They would be retaining all the stubble. They would be, they would be direct seeding with, with satellite guided interrow row sowing. So they may have widened their rows out a little bit to allow them to come back and seed between last year's rows. They will have cut the wheat um, beer can height. That's kind of the height that uh, they aim for to get the right mix of, of sort of uh, chaff on the ground and straw standing. Uh, and this guy's actually also on control traffic, so he's, he's using the same rows for spraying and harvesting and, um, and seeding. And just so I don't get into trouble with machinery manufacturers who may be here, the red ones can do it as well. Um, so there's another guy set up. Most people are on three metre spacings uh, with their control traffic and they slowly convert all their gear so that you know, all of it can run um, on the same wheel track. So this sort of control traffic um, and uh, uh, also allows people to use precision ag. There's, there's growing, um, growing uptake of that. I think it's, it was 25%. It's, it's increasing every year anyway. As people learn to, to use the technology and um, uh, so that's, that's uh, kind of where we're at uh, now. So where are we heading? I guess there's new opportunities and challenges in, in canola production and uh, in all areas really, in the high rainfall zones. Um, you can see on the, your left there, uh, people are, are growing canola on raised beds. Um, this is not an irrigated area, but it's an, it's an area which has very high rainfall in the winter and typically water logs. And up until this raised bed farming started, it was just low value water log pasture country. Um, but in this case, a grower group called Southern Farming Systems um, started this raised bed farming in that area and have just completely uh, 
turned around the, the profitability of the farms in that area because with the raised beds and controlled water logging, they can actually get they can actually make use of the high rainfall and grow extremely high yielding canola and wheat crops on raised beds. Um, and with the with the availability of long seas and herbicide tolerant hybrids, um, they're really getting some very high yields in that area. In the lower rainfall uh, zone, the breeding companies continually bring out uh, better adapted shorter season, both uh, a canola. We do have a juncia, a mustard program, uh, and there are varieties, uh, canola quality mustards have been released in that area. And I guess in the lower rainfall zone, it's, it's mainly moving towards precision systems, managing inputs where canola is, you know, is a risky crop. They really have to stay on top of their inputs and, and the no-till uh, systems allow them to do that. And where, we, where, where canola is typically grown, we now have all these, this new range of, of um, of GM hybrids which really weren't available to us until 2009. I think we're really still getting the agronomy right around those. So with that I'd say thank you for listening. Um, thank you to the organisers again and if there's any time I'll take some questions. Otherwise please, uh, I'm going to be here for two days. If, if, anything, what I, if anything I said interests you, please don't hesitate to come and grab me. And I'd love to learn some, some more about how you guys are doing in this area. So thanks a lot. Time for a few questions. Um, we have everything. We have everything, um, <clears throat> but quite a lot of acid soils um, uh, in in southern areas, and then quite alkaline soils around <clears throat> South Australia. So, but for canola, we would be wanting uh, the pH to be five in calcium chloride. We'd want growers to be liming so that the surface soil was at least five in calcium chloride. That would be what we say. Um, and uh, yeah, so that's that's kind of where they try and hold it. But it's a <clears throat> yeah, a lot of acid and alkaline soils. There's, there's very few soils in Australia that are you know just neutral. Yeah. <coughs> Yeah, um, it's a good question. The, our major pests are establishment pests. Uh, we have a, a mite called red-legged earth mite, which can come into fields in two or three days and sort of wipe you out if you're not, if you're not careful. Uh, and we have increasing problems with establishment pests. I think they've sort of, they're starting to develop uh, as canola becomes more widespread. So weevils, um, earwigs, uh, a lot of chewing insect pests early. I mean, we have reasonably cheap uh, insecticide seed dressings that we can use um, to control those, but that's, that's becoming a problem. Um, the other main pest would be Heliothus, uh, which is a, you know, a, a moth that, that lays a caterpillar. That, that can come in and attack crops at flowering. And aphids. Um, so they would be probably the, the key pests. Um, we have a pretty strong program in Australia in canola of understanding the, the nat natural predators of all of those pests and trying to manage them. We try to manage the red-legged earth mite in the pasture phase the year before in the spring when it's actually you know doing its thing. So there's been quite a lot of good work on understanding the ecology of those insects and trying to keep the, the level of insecticides low as much for the economics as, as for the environmental effects. And um, I was really amazed I went out to look at a crop with a farmer and uh, we were just walking through and he was, yeah, he knew four or five species of predatory wasp and, and other insects that were in his crop. He, he was looking for those and he really was making decisions on spraying based on, on um, just the levels of these other, other, other pests. So it's not something I've personally worked on a lot, but um, yeah, they're there and, and, and the establishment pests are increasing, so yeah. And I should say that um, under no-till, that they create more challenges. You know, the stubble is a nice habitat for a lot of these establishment pests. And actually, there's a new five-year project starting now in, in, in stubble management in Australia, na nationwide. And one of the issues, they're just sort of focusing on the key issues they're having trouble with. And one of the issues is some of the establishment pests of, of, um, of canola in, in retained stubble systems. So it's, it's a current issue.